Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is designed to be a free-flowing session with lots of participation, I hope, from, from all of you. I mean, I think originally this was conceived as a sort of an iPad interactive session, but this is a cosy group. And um, I, I quite honestly, on reflection, I feel like uh, it feels like asking my dad to wear a, a leather jacket. I just think we're not going to pull it off, this iPad thing. So I think we'll just stick to doing it the usual way, which is that we will have, I anticipate, a very lively discussion here. And then we will invite uh, as many comments and suggestions, um, questions from the floor. Um, so that is how we will proceed. And uh, I'm going to first of all introduce my very distinguished and sparkling panel. And I'm very grateful to you all uh, for making the effort to be here. First of all, I'm going to introduce Professor Roger Scruton, the eminent uh, conservative thinker, writer, and philosopher, great favorite of the ladies, Lady Thatcher, I mean, um, who, who has authored many books on, on many subjects, from fox hunting to sexual desire, more connected than you might first think. Is that right, Roger? Um, and his most recent book, uh, his most recent book, a novel, uh, Notes from Underground, which is part thriller, part love story, it, about um, the last uh, days of the communist regime in Prague, is now available in all good bookshops. Uh, so perfect summer reading. Simon Jenkins, Sir Simon Jenkins, knighted for his services to journalism, but also chair of the National Trust, and before that, deputy chair of English Heritage. And on occasion, he has used his, his newspaper columns to rage against some of our national cultural initiatives, which, in his words, have more public money than sense. And he's also written many books, uh, mostly with the word best in their title. Best churches, best houses, and most recently, best views. All celebrations of beauty. And he observes that the words beauty and pleasure are too often absent from debates about the arts and our national heritage. Ed Vesey is the Minister for Arts. Uh, the catchy version is Culture, Communications and the Creative Industries. Um, Ed has survived the white, male, public school, Oxbridge-educated ministerial cull thus far. <laughs> when is the reshuffle? Well, I think the end of my career may be tonight. <laughs> um, because, and he's, because I suspect he knows and he loves his subject, and he's been doing this job in government and before that in opposition uh, since 2006. And Munira, Munira Mertzer is, is Deputy Mayor of London. She's presided over many of London's most successful cultural programs and initi initiatives over the last six years, including commissions for the Olympics. Um, of course, and the wonderful Trafalgar Square uh, fourth plinth competition. And she's also found time to write and to think about cultural policy. And her recent book, The Politics of Culture, uh, makes the case for universalism in cultural policy and argues that emphasizing specific identity and specific cultural or racial heritage is increasingly out of date and often counterproductive. And Sir Peter Bazalgett is the chair of the Arts Council, former chair of English National Opera, also president of the Royal Television Society. Uh, he started his career at the BBC, but he's really known for his contribution to independent television, where he spent his career inventing highly successful television formats and franchises, including the first reality TV show, the now ubiquitous format, but he, he did it first, uh, uh, Big Brother. And he says his proudest achievements have been to make facts entertaining. And the Daily Mail columnist Quentin Letts remains unconvinced, devoting a chapter to him in his book, The 50 People That Buggered Up Britain. But, <laughs> but his many supporters, both inside and outside the arts establishment, describe him as a brilliant and welcome breath of fresh air. So, ladies and gentlemen, your panel. So, 
Before I launch into my first question, I'd just like to make one point, if I may. This conference commemorates the life of a truly remarkable and radical human being. And with respect to this subject, uh, this won't be the first or the last time a clever group of people are gathered together uh, to discuss it. So my challenge to all of you, to all of us, is to abandon caution and be as radical in our thinking as she would expect. <coughs> so with that in mind, um, I'm going to ask each member of the panel to comment on this as a sort of starting question. If you had the luxury of starting with a blank piece of paper, People in government always complain, it's a pity we're starting from here. Well, imagine if we weren't starting from here, what would be the optimum conditions for a flourishing arts and cultural sector in this country? And I'm going to ask Roger to talk about that for three or minutes or so first. It's a very difficult question, uh, uh, because if, if you're really starting from a blank piece of paper, my instinct is to keep it blank. Yeah, because uh, it, then it doesn't get muddled up and, uh, and used for the wrong purpose. Uh, the, the, the great problem with all arts policies is that they become uh, colonized by vested interests or by uh, politicization, by people with an ideological grievance uh, and so on. Uh, and this we've seen time and again. Uh, so one wants to know exactly what a, a government should be guided by if it is actually having such a policy at all. In our country, we have tended to think, until recently at least, that uh, the people create uh, the culture. Uh, and uh, the best way of ensuring that the culture survives is to give them the freedom to go on doing so. Uh, and um, if people aren't prepared to pay for it, uh, then it's going to die anyway. Uh, and maybe that is too idealistic, but I think that is a, the sort of thing that Mrs. Thatcher would say, and, um, may, and has a lot to be said for it. And, that is a, and I think that is, of course, still, in, to a great extent, the American approach. Uh, by contrast, however, we must recognize what the French do. The French have always thought that culture, is a, a culture and the arts are a fundamental concern of the government because the fundamental role of the government is to maintain in being uh, the, the, the nas national identity and national character. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the nation has always been fundamental in their uh, cultural policy. It's about uh, maintaining, representing, and putting on display the great thing that France is or was. Uh, and that's the problem. <laughs> That, is that, thank you, Roger. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ed, did you want to go on from that? You... Well, I think that the um, uh, first and foremost uh, thing on your blank sheet of paper would be uh, that you'd want to follow the policies of Mrs. Thatcher. So it is important that <clears throat> direct government intervention isn't at the core of what makes our arts sector flourish, what is at the core are the values that she stood for uh, and defended uh, of uh, freedom and liberty and free expression. And I suppose it's, a, it's an irony, perhaps a trite thing for me to say, it's an irony that um, the left-wing arts establishment uh, don't understand that uh, those kind of conditions are what allows them to flourish and make their art, and the kind of art we see in this country is not the kind of art you'd see in many regimes which don't uh, follow those principles. Uh, I think it was Jenny Lee said that um, what the arts need from government is money and silence. And it, <laughs> if we're talking about M Margaret Thatcher, I am reminded of my, one of my favorite anecdotes about her, which is that, and I've been doing this job for a very long time, for eight years, four years in opposition, four years in government, by following a carefully calibrated strategy of keeping my head down. And there was, <laughs> supposedly, there was supposedly an arts minister serving under Margaret Thatcher who was anxious to keep his job. And he stopped the chief whip in the corridor and said, uh, I know there's a reshuffle coming up. Could you put in a good word for me? 
And the chief whip replied, don't worry, she doesn't even know you're there. <laughs> so uh, perhaps that's also uh, the second element of your blank sheet of paper, to keep yourself very much in the background and not to interfere too much, to allow clever people like Peter Bazalgette uh, to make the uh, tough decisions. Uh, but I suppose the third bit, to stop being too facetious, is that uh, I do believe in, as it were, I subscribe, as it were, to the establishment view. I do think it is important the government uh, plays a role in funding the arts. I think the Arts Council is a well-run and good organisation. I'm pleased that we have uh, a stipend that can go to something like six or seven hundred different arts organisations of various shapes and sizes from the Royal Opera House downwards. I'm pleased that we have something like 400 million pounds that goes to secure our national collections uh, in our national museum. So I think government will always play a role. Uh, but it is also important to remember that governments has a, has a much wider role to ensure that there, are, uh, there is freedom uh, and the conditions for the arts to flourish without necessarily always writing the cheque. Thank you, Ed. Simon, can I ask you to comment on that? Um, yes, yeah, yeah, so, you know, I, I start from, from the language. Um, I'm always intrigued by people in the arts world. They always talk about funding the arts. Um, Funding is normally investing. They talk about investing the art, in the arts. Investment means you're putting money into something and getting a return from it. Um, you don't get a financial return from the arts. I wish people would talk about spending money on the arts, particularly other people's money. Um, that's what we ask, we're being asked to do. Um, and it, and, it, and the, the endless sanitizing of public expenditure as funding or investing does not help the argument. Um, I, I believe there is a role for public spending money on the arts. I think the state has always been a patron of the arts. Um, the arts reflect the glory of the state where appropriate, and that's, a, that's the right thing for the state to do. Um, I also think there's a role for the state in innovating uh, in the arts. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, as in the sciences, you do not roll forward. There's, it's always been the case that the state has, has spent money on uh, things that other, things other people would not spend the money on. But as far as blank sheets of paper are concerned, I mean, it's, it's a real think tank question. I mean, you never start with a blank sheet of paper in politics, ever. Um, so it's an unhelpful way of approaching it. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, um, the, 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 particularly with the heritage, the whole point of the heritage is the piece of paper wasn't blank. Uh, the point of the heritage is there's something on that paper and we value it. And unless we can articulate the value we put in the past, in my case in the past, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. And in a funny way, we've lost the language of the past. Um, Margaret Thatcher knew it. Margaret Thatcher never would have touched the green belt. She never would have touched national parks or areas of outstanding national beauty. She, she really did value them. I used to hear her going on about them. Um, there is none of that language left in, in, in government circles. And, um, and I think that the danger there is not necessarily a lack of will, um, because most politicians I know do actually rather like the landscape and the countryside. Um, but they've lost the technique of defending it. And because the entire language of public policy at the moment is towards a rather grim philistinism, um, which is another word for growth, um, uh, the, 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 the arts of defending the arts have deteriorated. We have lost the language of beauty. Uh, in fact, it's, it's rather unfashionable to use the word at all. Uh, and the result is, I believe, just at the moment, we've probably got a bigger threat to uh, the aspects of the heritage people most value, which is actually the countryside, than we've ever had since the war. They want to clap that, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Peter. Yeah, I was interested to hear uh, Roger Scruton uh, talk about what Margaret Thatcher would have said or would have thought. I'd like to tell you about something Margaret Thatcher actually did say. One of my predecessors, the saintly William Rees Mogg, who was chair of the Arts Council, when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, she used to give him an audience once a year. And she only would raise one issue with him. Now, Mr. Rees-Mogg, you are going to give lots more money to the Royal Opera House, aren't you? So that we can attract lots more plutocrats to London, is what William Rees-Mogg reported her as saying. In those days, the Royal Opera House, the per percentage of its uh, revenue that came from the state was about 60%. Today, it's uh, 23%. So I'm afraid we've been moving radically away from Margaret Thatcher's excessive support, state support of the arts in favour of a more mixed and robust model. Uh, just to pick up on what uh, Simon Jenkins quite rightly said, we talk as though arts state funding of the arts started in 1946 when Maynard Keynes set up the Arts Council, or you could say uh, SEMA during the war, but it's not, it's not that. It goes back a lot much further, as Simon said. Uh, Henry VIII employed 58 musicians in his court. Um, 
uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent, of whom you'll all be familiar, uh, uh, in uh, Florence uh, in 1500, employed Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo and Botticelli all at the same time and deployed them. Uh, he had no army, but he had cultural diplomacy and he used to lend them out to places like Milan and Rome that did have an army. Uh, I noticed, in fact, that Lorenzo the Magnificent uh, spent in Florence, if you multiply that into today's money, 300 million pounds. That's exactly the sum of money that Ed Vesey gives the Arts Council to invest, pardon the expression, Simon, uh, in the arts. So I like to think of Vesey the Magnificent <coughs> deploying his cultural diplomacy. They still don't think it's enough. Uh, and so to answer your question about your blank sheet of paper, uh, uh, it's not exactly, uh, the, the model's been laid down for centuries, and it is a mixture. It's a mixture of uh, state, um, shall we say, seed corn, mm. and state interest in, uh, in expression of its culture, its reputation worldwide, its standing, its power, and all those things. It's a mixture of those things, and, in, and, and, and the paying public and those who wish philanthropically to support it. We have that mixture, I think, in quite a good blend at the moment. Uh, it's more state support in, on the continent and less state support in America. I think the British compromise in the middle is quite a good one. Okay. Thank you very much. Munira. Uh, so my starting point is a principle or an outcome that I want to see, which is that, that great art will survive uh, for future generations. <coughs> And I believe that there are certain types of art form, certain types of artistry, which are inherently expensive, which at the present time are not always popular, don't always attract high attendance, and don't survive on the market alone. Certainly not if we want affordable ticket prices for most people. Uh, and on that basis, I think that there is an argument for the state to step in to address a market failure. Uh, which is a classic liberal argument. That's how the Arts Council was originally conceived, that it would support those kinds of art forms like the opera, like ballet, where uh, the market would not ensure that those art forms would continue at the excellence, at the standards that they, were, um, um, that they should be and still be a price that people could afford. So I think there is a kind of classic liberal argument in favour of um, state funding. I think there are caveats to that state support. As people have already said, it shouldn't be... Uh, too intrusive, it shouldn't be too overwhelming, uh, it should be held in check by other types of funding perhaps, so the, the mixed model that, that Peter talks about um, I think has been quite healthy in that uh, if you only have state funding for an art form, uh, there's no incentive for an organisation to go out and find an audience. You know, why would they bother if they always get the same check written to them every year? So there are certain uh, things that we need to do to ensure state funding isn't too um, dominant. Uh, there are also other things that the state can do which are not just funding. For instance, the planning regulations, uh, listing buildings, which is a massive help to the heritage sector. I mean, National Trust would not be where it is today were it not for that kind of state intervention. Uh, the, uh, the help of uh, tax regulation, tax incentives and, and regulation in the arts um, or in certain types of art production um, are also helpful. So there are conditions that the state can introduce that help the arts to flourish without being too heavy-handed. The, I think that one of the issues in the political debate at the moment is that there is sometimes a tendency, um, I think, on the right to, to talk about no funding for the arts from the state as being the ideal position. I think I can understand where that comes from, but it's not, it, it doesn't really reflect the reality of where we are today. And I think that in some ways it becomes quite a tired debate and it uh, misses some of the real problems, actually, with state funding of the arts, which I think can be sometimes... Uh, uh, not as diverse in the broader sense uh, as it could be. Uh, I think there are some areas of reform that might need to happen with um, institutions. And I would say that um, you know, for people who are interested in freedom and who are interested in genuine standards and excellence and genuine diversity, that rather than arguing against state funding for the arts per se, that it's much more effective to talk about the way that the state funds the arts and the kind of art sector that we want and to talk about reforming and changing aspects of it rather than uh, thinking that it's uh, 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 noble and uh, 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 intellectually superior to, talk that, to say that arts funding from the state is a bad thing in itself. Thank you, Munira. Picking up on, on, on reforming institutions, I mean, has, has state funding ensured the arts remain the preserve of the middle classes? I mean, does that, does that matter? You asked me, yes. sorry. Um, 
I mean, the original purpose of the Arts Council was that state funding for the arts would allow ordinary people to enjoy the arts, the, the arts on offer. And I think that's a good principle, and that should really be um, at the heart of, of, of state funding. It's not the only reason, actually. There are certain types of uh, state funding for culture, for instance, research um, in museums for, on objects, which is, is not going to have a direct public benefit. There aren't people, pe ordinary people are not going to immediately appreciate the impact of that. But it's very important for the preservation of our culture national, international, uh, et cetera. So there are some aspects of state funding um, where you can't measure its value purely on the basis of the number of people who experience it. Um, the arts have become more inclusive, but not, as you say, not uh, as inclusive as people would like. There are some broader issues there about education, uh, people's time and leisure. Uh, I wouldn't want to punish the arts for, uh, and, and diminish the arts that we have in this country, which are, you know, are great. Uh, because they don't attract more working class people, I think that would be a mistake. And um, Peter, do you, do you, does it matter? Well, it matters if you're deploying public money, whether that in the case of the Arts Council is the taxpayer's dollar or the lottery ticket buyer's dollar. It matters that that is uh, available to everybody. But let me just make one thing clear. It is not obligatory to either like or attend the opera. But what is important is that people are offered the opportunity to go, both because they have been introduced at school to the arts in general, and secondly, because it would be affordable to go. In this respect, by the way, the digital transmission of theatre, opera, and ballet is the most, pretty well the most exciting thing that's happened in the last two or three years. And this is the first year the Royal Opera House will have more people uh, watching its productions, its ballet and opera, on big screens and in cinemas than actually physically attending. But that means that um, in terms of education, Everybody should get the chance to have a decent education in the visual and performing arts because that, first of all, unlocks their creativity. <clears throat> Secondly, it may be a career they wish to pursue. Um, and it means that arts organisations that take public funding should have educational outreach programmes, which, by the way, they do now far more than they did 20, 30 years ago. The Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford will come into contact with 400,000 British school children this year. So that's very important. Um, I, I'm bound to say that I think the Etonians, who win nearly all the BAFTAs uh, for, uh, for, for male actor, are very good actors. But I'm also bound to say they can't be the only good actors in the country. And I do think sometimes that um, the state sector, which educates 93% of our children, possibly doesn't generate quite the, the creative and acting talent that it potentially could were people in that sector given the same quality of education in the visual and performing arts that you get in private schools. Thank you, Peter. I mean, Simon, did you want to comment on, it's often a criticism of the National Trust, which is that it's, it's, it's middle class in its, its reach and its um, it audience, whether that matters. What, the criticism or the fact? The, whether, well, both. <laughs> criticism or the lie. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's not true. Right. I mean, uh, it, it is simply not true. I don't know I, I, what else I can say. Um, we're quite, we're, we're, we're the, the average age of people who visit our properties is probably 50 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I'm terribly used to the contempt people have for people who are over 50, but I've got fed up with it. Um, yeah. I don't really see what's wrong with being over 50. It, it isn't the BBC, there's something, there's a disease which is called being old. <laughs> um, it absolutely enrages me. Um, most people who go to the opera are quite old. I don't regard them as imbecilic for get, liking the opera. Um, it, it's a, it is a national obsession, this. Um, where, 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 where I, what I care about is, is, is numbers, and I care about people paying. Um, and the, the, these conversations often become uh, an exchange of platitudes among the, the, the great and the good of the arts. And I, I always sort of kick against this a bit. Um, I can remember I mean, the strides Peter's been making to bring opera out through broadcast are extraordinary, but for 25 years, some of us were pleading with the Covent Garden and ENO uh, to, 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 go, to broadcast out into Trafalgar Square, Somerset House, yeah. to broadcast, going to theatres, no. No, why not? Because the unions wouldn't let them. They didn't fight the unions, they were quite happy to keep these pretty elitist activities, they don't mind that word, um, closed uh, to, to the group. And they demanded public subsidy. They did actually nothing in return for that subsidy. And it was uncontroversial because you, you, you mustn't insult opera. Now, I've always thought people who de demand public subsidy for their act the things they like doing, like going to the opera, have an absolute obligation to say why they want it. And they should have it, and other people shouldn't. 
You're, you're, you're actually demanding money from the mass of taxpayers for something you like doing. Why should you get it? The only way they've been able to do that is to transfer that demand, that requirement, that enjoyment into some new concept, which is that opera is, is, is above us all and pure and good. In other words, you're turning opera into a sort of religion that we worship at. Um, it's not just something we like. <laughs> and I think that's wrong. I've always thought that the arts have to articulate why it is they demand this privileged position, uh, which on the whole, working class people don't have, of having their enjoyments subsidized by the state. That's, that's my, my one point. As far as the National Trust is concerned, uh, we do not receive public revenue subsidy. Um, we make a surplus every year on our trading activity, which we put into our properties. Um, and that is a totally tight business proposition. We get public money for projects, for new buildings, for repairs and so on, but we do not do so for our ordinary trading activities. We are in competition with uh, national museums and local museums that are free. Uh, we've got 130 museums, which is our, our properties, registered museums, and we have to compete with the state that reckons to pay for museums that in this country do not charge at all. Um, I just think that those museums ought to prove why they should deserve the subsidy and we don't get the subsidy. If we can run museums without a subsidy, why can't they? This is real money. Um, many of them are in desperate straits at the moment. We are not. Uh, historic houses are not. Uh, we're doing very well because the, the economy is looking up. Um, why are the museums in such desperate straits? Uh, the answer is they don't charge anybody. Ed, did you want to comment on reintroducing charges for museums? Well, we're committed to keeping museums free and open, the National Museums, so I don't want Simon really to go away with the impression that there are hundreds of museums all across the country that are being kept open free thanks to taxpayer uh, money. And the original subsidy that went to uh, keep the museums free, which was introduced by the last government, has, I think, pretty much uh, withered in, in the sense of... Uh, the museums would argue when they're coming and asking for money that they should get more to represent the fact that they keep themselves free. To a certain extent, it's a theological position in the sense it's a belief that um, the national collections that belong to the nation should be open to uh, uh, everyone uh, to go in and see. Uh, and in reality, of course, museums also charge for their special exhibitions and they uh, charge for other things when people are in the building. So, uh, but I would say that uh, the National Trust and the National Museums are uh, complementary. Uh, I don't think one uh, crowds out the other. They're very different experiences and they're mainly located in very different places. Thanks. Roger, do you want to... Yeah, I, I would like to take issue with something that Simon just s said, or rather implied, um, th uh, about uh, the you know, whether the opera should be subsidised, whether my tastes uh, as an educated middle-class uh, elitist sort of person should be uh, provided by the honest labour of people who don't <coughs> share them. Um, I, I, I have to say that's not quite the right way I, the way I would put it when trying to persuade that person that he should subsidise it, but that is, of course, a truth. But I think he earlier referred to the... Uh, the countryside and the way in which we in England have conspired and agitated and campaigned to protect it uh, against development, and that's perfectly right. But in, in doing so, inevitably, we subsidize the views uh, and the environment of the, uh, the, those elite people who can live in it. Uh, so they also you know, are enjoying these values at the expense of others who have to make do with living on, uh, you know, on crowded estates because there, there isn't the right, any, the right to build in the countryside and enjoy uh, and spread this thing around. And, and he's right, of course, that, that that has been a very wonderful policy because it has placed beauty at the heart of our politics and made it into a goal in itself. Uh, uh, but I would say that the same is true of all aesthetic values. They're, they are not market values. Uh, an aesthetic value is an intrinsic value. It's not about, uh, about, it's not a value that is revealed in exchange. It's revealed in the act of contemplation and, and what it does to the quality of your life through that, that contemplation. We, in, we are very lucky that in Britain, par partly because of agitation by middle class people during the 1930s, um, we have put beauty at the center of our, uh, our political 
process, of our planning process, uh, and have tried to hold on to it. The greatest enemy of this has always been uh, government taxation, which has forced people to, uh, to sell uh, valuable things uh, instead of keeping them. Uh, and, um, and also, of course, the, the, the demographic problem that, that all uh, countries have um, confronted since the last war. But, so I, I think that, that if, if we're serious about beauty, we have to recognize that we are committed to defending a value which is not a market value, and that means distorting the market in the favor of the educated middle class. Thank you. Lizzie, can I just correct Please. an impression given? I mean, I, 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 I'm, uh, I, I'm not implying that you shouldn't subsidize opera. The point I was making is actually the point um, that, that Roger's very well articulated right there, is, is the importance of bringing the concept of aesthetics to the forefront of policy. In other words, subsidize opera, but explain why. Mm. Um, subsidize, uh, if, you, if you call it subsidize, I mean, I don't regard planning as subsidy, but it's a sort of subsidy, um, the protection of the countryside, um, but say why. Uh, it, it, we're doing it because we regard it as beautiful. And it is, it is a function of government, and, and you can see what happens when governments surrender a concern for beauty. It is a concern of government to protect what's beautiful. Um, and for what it's worth, views is probably the most democratic <coughs> thing we protect in this country. Um, it is the most popular public activity, is looking at a view. It's more popular than anything else anybody does, um, and everybody does it. And when you ask people what their favorite view is, you get the most wonderful replies. Uh, it's always to do with some personal experience. They were proposed to in this view, or they fell in love in this view or they always go back to this view when they're unhappy, or they rage at this view. The views, are, I'm obsessed with them, but the views are intrinsic to the, the, the concept that human beings have of aesthetics, so we ought to protect them. Yeah, but view, views are not set in aspect, and the built environment often enhances views, and you'll get plenty of people saying views across London are uh, very beautiful. But I would take issue with Simon. I think the theme of this panel should now be taking issue with Simon. <laughs> uh, on everything that he says, that somehow the government doesn't value beauty. And uh, it is always, unfortunately, the terrible position for a politician to start having to talk about policy and what the government is actually doing. But it's, it's quite boring to emphasize the fact that the National Planning Policy Framework, I agree, not a beautiful title, uh, does <laughs> put in place strong protection, describes it. <laughs> strong protection for the green belt. And actually, uh, I work very hard to get um, design principles written into it in terms of the houses that we build, and that's why I asked Terry Farrell to do a review of architectural policy as well, because uh, we believe in it. And I do, uh, in fact, uh, defend the Royal Opera House as I did in front of the Select Committee last week, where you would not uh, be surprised to learn that um, uh, MPs, in particular those with brass bands in their constituency, were keen to uh, question the value of the subsidy uh, the value of government funding for the Royal Opera House, which I vigorously defended. And I think Simon's problem is that he doesn't follow me enough on Google to see oh. the constant interventions I make in defence of beauty. <laughs> on behalf of the government, I might add. I, I promise to do so. <laughs> Peter, do you want to say anything about beauty? We're on to the subject of beauty and aesthetics. I think it's probably in the eye of the beholder, Lizzie. Right, OK. Thank well. you. God, no, um, <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to ask, I wanted to ask Ed about, I mean, moving away from state funding, um, I wanted to ask, when he uh, came into government, he did say, and, his, and at the time Jeremy Hunt said, the Culture Secretary said, he would, they would like to, uh, to, have to, to get more funding from rich private uh, sources and from philanthropists um, and from the wealth creators of this country. And I wanted to ask him, how's that going? Well, I would take issue with the way you put that question, uh, Lizzie. Um, we would like more private funding of the arts, but it's important, I think, to emphasize it doesn't, you don't have to be rich uh, to support the arts by giving donations. And I, again, got into trouble in front of the same select committee last week by implying that arts organizations outside London, where they uh, uh, have allowed themselves to be characterized as being, uh, say that it's too difficult to raise money from private sources. And part of the problem is that uh, when you talk about philanthropy, people think that's a cheque for five million quid. Well, in my world, philanthropy can be a cheque for fiver or a cheque for 50 quid. Um, I think uh, the Royal Opera House uh, ended up getting something like 26,000 people uh, subscribing uh, to support it. Uh, the Friends Schemes for National Museums, these are not uh, plutocrats uh, living on boats, but um, people giving small sums of money which add up and make a difference. Uh, 
I, anyway, to answer your question now, um, is I think it's going well. I mean, it is important, again, uh, to say that we are not asking people to fund the arts in place of government. I think the great strength of the uh, support for the arts that we have in this country is it is based on government support, private support from great philanthropists and small philanthropists, uh, as well as obviously the money that the arts earn for themselves. And we've put in place, back to boring policy points, but as well as gift aid, which is pretty generous, uh, other tax breaks introduced, for example, on inheritance tax, uh, and, but also specific funding given to the Arts Council to give to arts organisations to support their efforts in fundraising. So it's going, it's going pretty well. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, um, to, obsessing about fundraising is slightly looking in the wrong direction. Um, the thing that arts and cultural organisations have done, because they've needed to in the last few years, is they've greatly increased their commercial revenues. They've turned them, beginning to turn themselves into much more effective businesses. Fundraising is a small part of that. Just to give you a statistic, if you take the 700 uh, larger organisations that the Arts Council funds, uh, Ed, Ed referred to them earlier, if you average out their revenue, I wonder, would somebody like to suggest to me what percentage the Arts Council is of their revenue? Anybody want to suggest a number from the audience? Ten? Now you're just being provocative. That was very provocative, but very welcome. Anybody else? Anyway, it's 27, so <laughs> higher than you suggested. And thank you. I was hoping you were going to but say 60 or 70. Much lower than the 90% you exactly. really wanted no, to it say. No, it used to be. It used to be 50 or 60%. It's now about 27%. Now the point is that fundraising, philanthropy, is about 12%, but commercial revenues are about 56%. There's uh, other small amounts from local authorities and other public funding sources. So. Um, the, the arts, arts organisations do need to diversify their revenue streams, and I think public money gives them a, quite a sound basis uh, by which to do that. And um, tax reliefs and other helps, like the theatre tax relief that's just come in, it's quite helpful. But also we need to develop other things like social investment models. And actually we've been working closely with the Cabinet Office to develop some new social investment model funds where people may wish to invest in arts and cultural organisations. Uh, perhaps their principal is relatively safe, but they don't get much of a dividend, but the public good that's delivered is the dividend. And um, these forms of soft loans or equity will be new to the arts uh, sector, but there's something we need to develop. So there's lots going on there, and philanthropy is, a, is a, an important but a small part of it. It's only, Peter, that uh, all the tables show that as, as a country, we're very generous in terms of small donations um, from people of modest means, but actually we don't fare so well in terms of very big ticket um, gifts from, from the richest uh, uh, section of uh, of people, so that's just an observation. Mm. But and that particularly sh true, I think, in London, where we could indeed, I think, should be able to attract people to support us in in, in ways and on very sort of big ticket uh, opportunities in London. I don't, Minera, I don't know whether you wanted to talk about that and then move on to. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I work for the mayor, and he's um, always trying to tap up rich donors for money for various projects and schemes. So he, he. You know, he recognizes that London has all these very wealthy individuals and that they should be giving back. So, you know, the, lots, I think lots of organizations and um, agencies are trying to do that. Uh, and it's right that they, they do. Um, I'd, I'd caution, one thing I would caution about philanthropy, um, and it's the same um, caution I would um, uh, put forward about state funding, is that all of these types of funders have their own uh, aversion to risk and particular types of risk. And that's why the mixed funding model is quite an effective one, because it means that um, if you can't get funding from a philanthropist to do something a bit risky uh, and difficult that their corporate clients might not want to uh, go to, then you could get the state potentially to do that. Um, the state it has its own aversion to risk and that it doesn't want anything that might be deemed as politically incorrect often. And, you know, so the, there are other things that um, the state might, um, might avoid funding. So the, the mixed funding model, I think, makes organisations look for a broader base of support, which is a healthy thing. I just wanted to return to the one point that, um, or the point that's come up about why people don't articulate the beauty of art forms. Uh, why, and, 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 you know, why don't people in the world of opera talk about how fantastic their art form is and that it should be funded because of X, Y, Z? And I think there is a general retreat from defending art in its own terms. So you defend art because it helps with social cohesion or it helps with 
health outcomes or it helps with employment and education and so on. And um, This retreat from saying that art has a value <coughs> and that value transcends the particular moment of, of, of time, it's something that needs to be preserved and protected, has come under attack from a populist left that says, well, you might say that about your art form, that's just because you're middle class. And then a populist right that says, well, who are you to decide? Shouldn't the market just be left to decide? So it's a pincer movement from the right and the left that has made arts organisations fail sometimes to make the case for what they do. And I think that that has changed a bit in, in the last 10, 15 years in some ways. I think Simon is slightly out of date. I think arts organisations do want to bring in new audiences and they do... Um, they, you know, they do feel passionate, actually, about wanting to, to broaden their reach. But they are inevitably on the defensive because of a political culture that says art doesn't have a value for its own sake. I, I don't agree with that at all. I think that, uh, you know, I don't think you should uh, characterise it as a retreat uh, or as an either-or. Uh, the arguments for funding the arts are fundamentally based on their intrinsic value. But, of course, there are other arguments about... Uh, the impact that the arts can have uh, in other areas of life, if you like. But I'm not it's denying part, that It's either. partly driven by a, the, how you get money. So if you're a museum and you want money from your local health authority, uh, you're probably not going to get a grant if you say what we do is intrinsically valuable. But you will get a grant if you say that um, for dementia patients and so on, handling objects from their past, as it were, is very therapeutic and very helpful. So that's one of the reasons why these arguments are put, but I don't think people are retreating from the fact that supporting the arts is fundamentally uh, a good thing. I do think as well that part of the issue, the reason people debate why should we fund the arts is because to a certain extent, if I was to articulate a frustration as an arts minister, the only conversation you do tend to have with arts organisations is about how much money you mm. give them. And what is really, really irritating is this cavalier use of the word philistine. And uh, it's bizarre, you know, if you don't give the arts the money they feel they deserve, you're a philistine. Completely meaningless insult. Uh, and that is why if the arts, if a certain part of the arts sector wants to simply have a debate about money, uh, that is why perhaps uh, the debate becomes, well, is it worth giving the money? I happen to believe very firmly it is worth giving the money to the arts, but sometimes the arts perhaps shouldn't be surprised if by calling anyone who won't write them a cheque a philistine, they could provoke a debate about <laughs> whether it's worth writing them a cheque. Look, I mean, pick, can I pick up on that, Lizzie? I yes, mean, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> Manira made a very good point about, about the, what might call the attack on, 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 on the value of the arts from both left and right. <clears throat> People who value the arts can pay for it. I mean, the, the, the insult is, you know, do you value the arts or do you want to leave them to the market? Well, the people in the marketplace presumably value the arts because they pay for it, they buy tickets. Um, and I, I, this is the problem of the language that's developed as a result of, of, of public subsidy being the other side of the, of the cake. Um, people who run arts institutions regard the, the, the state or the fundraisers, they're the same thing in a sense, as the people who raise the money and they spend the money. And, and it's all in the, the name of the great god, the arts. But, but, it, but to me, the people who should pay for the arts, primarily, are those people who enjoy them, who value them, who want to go to them, who want to, who want to take part in them in some sense. Um, the problem arises when you have a particular art form that's developed in a sense, a sort of a, a speciality um, or, or an entitlement uh, to money that they can't raise from those people who enjoy it. Um, and here I think there's a real argument, and I just, all, I, all I say is I think, I think those people who want that money from other people should, should, should somehow find ways of justifying it. The National Trust doesn't get 20% or 30% or 10% of our money from the state. Um, the people who enjoy National Trust properties support the National Trust to the tune of about 150% of the cost of providing the, the, the things they value. Um, th that's how much I believe they value it. Um, I don't think they, they're, 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 the, they're the mere market. Um, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a form of uh, artistic activity, appreciation of the heritage, um, which they genuinely value. Um, and I, 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 would, I would like to think every arts organisation would regard that at least as what might be called the baseline from which they start. Thank you very much. Simon, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Peter's going to come in, mm. and then I hope we'd have some comments from the floor. Um, We're having too good a time up here. Right, okay, Why well, do you want to involve can, the floor? I was, uh, <laughs> I was just going to say very quickly that um, I don't think... Simple deficit is, is, is the only part of that equation, Simon. I do think one of the purposes of public money 
is to encourage people to take risks that they wouldn't otherwise take. Um, and I always think today's outrage is tomorrow's mainstream. And whether I'm talking about funding of arts and culture or whether I'm thinking of BBC funding, I think quite a lot of that money goes towards getting people to do fairly uh, what we regard as outre things, new ideas, shock of the new. Uh, and so I think public money, far from, um, as it were, um, assisting the mainstream, if properly deployed with the right conditions attached, actually gets us to reinvent, renew our, our culture. Thank, thank you very much. Roger, are you wanting to well, have a uh, quickly? Because um, we're going to have some questions on the no, floor. No, it was just the word renew always gives me the shivers. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Right, on that note, anyone else want to, has got any shivery moments? Um, yes, but Daniel, the front. Thank you. Daniel Johnson, standpoint. Um, doesn't an awful lot of public money that's supposed to be for the arts actually go on arts administrators? I mean, you mentioned Mrs. Thatcher. In her day, it was a tiny little ministry of the arts, um, you know, run by intelligent amateurs like Grey Gowrie. Today, we have this vast behemoth, um, this cabinet-level uh, department of culture, media, and sport. I mean, would it actually make any difference to the arts in this country if that entire department were abolished tomorrow? Well, um, I'll Peter. let Ed speak for his department. But no, if I, I, may... I, I pay you to defend me, Peter. Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I am, I am Ed's friendly Philistine. Um, no, but I was just going to say, actually, I think the reverse is true. I think more money was going into the administration of the arts, certainly over the last decade, Daniel, um, the cost of administrating the arts from the Arts Council's point of view has come down from 17% of total revenue to 5% of total revenue. So actually, in the last few years, one of the products of the cuts in funding has been to deliver a lot more efficiency and more money on the front in the actual organisations. That, but that's I'm speaking for the Arts Council. I, I will actually let Ed speak for his excellent department, his much-valued department. I just wanted to check what effect the word efficiency was having on Roger. <laughs> watching, watching for careful well, buzzwords. Well, I, I think the renewed efficiency is what we should be talking about. What we need renewed is renewed, we need renewed efficiency <laughs> in, the, in the arts. Uh, well, we, we are a much smaller department than we were when we began in 2010. And um, I think we're rather a metaphor for the astonishingly good job this government has done. We're, our current office, for example, costs us several million pounds a year less than our old office. And uh, everybody's much happier working in it. We've also significantly reduced uh, the costs of the Arts Council itself in terms of uh, how many people work there. I think overall, if you took the two main organisations, the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council and the Arts Council, in 2010 combined, there were 1,000 people, and I think they're now roughly 400 combined. So uh, we, hear, we heard what Daniel was thinking four years ago, and we acted on it with a view to coming to this panel okay, to bring him the good news. <laughs> Thank you. Have we got some more comments over there? Can we take those three in a row, please? Thank you. Can you pass the microphone along and then we'll just distribute it to the panel as those three, three of you in a row. Thank you very much. Um, the, Be efficient. Hurry up. <laughs> the talk of uh, uh, Philistines. If, you're, if, we're a Philist, if we're Philistines, why shouldn't we be allowed to keep our money and, um, and enjoy our Philistine tastes? Um, if people want uh, riskier projects to be undertaken than would be undertaken by uh, people freely spending their own money as they see fit, um, why can't those people who back those riskier projects uh, back them with their own money? And um, lastly, I'd just like to say that seeing as it's the Margaret Thatcher Conference on Liberty, one of Margaret Thatcher's quotes was, there's no such thing as public money, only taxpayers' money. Yeah. Thank you very much. You, you're gonna, can we add you in there, please, gentle, sir. Yes, uh, certainly. I just wanted to say, we've had a discussion about the arts, but nobody's mentioned uh, television. It strikes me that uh, that's one of the main art forms that is popular and that the majority of the population actually enjoy and engage with. Um, but we still feel the need to have a BBC, which if I want to own a television, um, but I don't want to fund the BBC's work, I still have to pay that licence fee. Otherwise, I could be fined and go to prison. And I would like an answer from the uh, minister on whether he thinks that's uh, a good way about going about things. 
come back, come back to you on the BBC because we're going to ask the whole panel about the BBC. My at name the end. is Keith Boyfield. Years ago, I remember watching oh, Muriel Gray on television where she was covering an experiment with some local art galleries which were lending out paintings and sculptures to people in council houses. I was thinking, why don't we try and encourage uh, more of that sort of thing? There are huge numbers of paintings, drawings, engravings in the basements of city art galleries and even national art museums, some of which might not be that expensive. Mm -hmm. With Lord Strathclyde's help, he used to be an insurance broker. I'm sure we can sort out the insurance side, but then you might actually get people in. If they can borrow okay. a book, they can borrow a okay, DVD, thank you. why not bar borrow a painting? Thank you very much. Well, it seems to be that if you, with respect to those comments, really, but one, one is a question about the BBC, which brings me on just to ask, if I may, particularly with um, Sir Peter here, um, just, to, what, just a, a quick fire uh, ask of the panel what they think about the BBC. Um, should British taxpayers continue to fully subsidise the BBC? We've got the Royal Charter um, renewal in 2016. Can I ask Eddie first? Oh, I thought we were going to ask Peter first. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure that the BBC is, is fully subsidised by the licence fee payer uh, because it now does earn quite a significant commercial income from BBC Worldwide. Uh, again, we froze the licence fee when we came in uh, to office. We froze it for uh, seven years, so I think that was a, a significant point. And uh, as uh, Lizzie indicated, the charter review for the BBC will kick off uh, at some point. Uh, the charter runs out at the end of 2016. Uh, and I'm sure all these issues will uh, be debated about uh, the nature of the licence fee and the funding of the BBC itself. Uh, and don't forget, of course, as well, that we are consulting on whether a failure to pay your licence fee should be decriminalised. So all these things are being uh, looked at and uh, discussed, and no doubt people will put their views forward. Uh, I mean, again, obviously what lies behind the premise of the question, not just uh, the mechanism of funding the BBC, but... Uh, whether you know the BBC should be effectively privatised, as I suppose what you're arguing. I happen to be a strong fan of the BBC. I do think it sets uh, a quality bar. I think that one of the reasons that British television is so successful is because of the BBC. Uh, and I think e even the commercial broadcasters who often uh, you know rub up against the BBC would not want to see it um, disappear. And I think the great British public uh, do. Uh, just checking Roger's reaction to that one. Uh, I think the British public do really value the BBC. Thank you. Peter, can I ask uh, on that? And, of course, Absolutely. everyone who complains about the licence fee listens avidly to Radio 4 or and Radio 3 all day long. And as we approach that national sport known as BBC Charter Renewal, uh, you find that all the train spotters come out of the closet and start to talk about technology, governance, level of salaries, and they do lose the wood for the trees. So... Do you or don't you want the BBC? Leave on one side whether it's a compulsory form of uh, funding or not. Uh, different, different discussion. Do you want the BBC? In my opinion, the BBC is for three things. To be a trusted and reliable source of news and information. To put a maximum investment into original content that people both enjoy and that expresses their culture. And thirdly, to develop talent, which is of immense value to the creative industries, which are a very important part of this country. And I would say about the first thing, I mentioned first, the, the, the trusted and reliable source of news and information. I think that it's the highest expression of a sophisticated democracy that public money goes into a news organisation that can criticise the government. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the panel want to say anything about the B BBC? Yes. Have you got, uh, Roger, have you got a, tele have you got a television? Roger? Unfortunately, I now have, yes, but I have. <laughs> how, did, um, how did that happen? The children prevailed. <laughs> um, but it is, it is a thing for children, obviously, <laughs> um, not for grown-ups. It's outrageous. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would say, of course, that the, um, there is every reason for the, to, for the public funding to be... Uh, spent on something that we, we recognize to be valuable in itself and that wouldn't be provided otherwise. Um, and if objective, impartial news, which, um, which is partly boring, partly informative, but nevertheless necessary, that is a fantastic thing to fund. I haven't heard such a thing on the BBC for an awful long time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as a, an ordinary part of the left establishment, it seems to me it ought to try and fund itself. 
Anyone else on the panel want to say anything about Munira? You would put your pennies worth in on the BBC. I mean, I think there is a role for a public broadcaster. It's an institution that's existed for a long time. So I'm inherently conservative about institutions in that I think it, my fear would be that if you try to get rid of the BBC, what would you replace it with? Uh, it, I, my view is to reform it, to mend, not end. But I recognise that it has problems and you know, it, does need, uh, it does need to be looked at in terms of efficiencies. Uh, there is the accusation of bias, not just in the news and the current affairs, but in the broader feel of drama, etc. Um, you know, there is a culture within the BBC, as in many institutions, that probably needs to be looked at. So, um, but I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think to, that the end of the BBC would be a great thing for our culture, necessarily. I, thank you, Simon. That, that's I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the game is up. I mean, the, the, you can't go on imposing a poll tax on people's television sets um, when they've got every other kind of electronic device to entertain themselves. I just think it can't last. And I also think, in a more general sense, the days when you have these big bureaucracies like, like, like the NHS and the BBC and so on, um, sort of hangovers from, from the post war welfare state. Um, commanding monopolies, it, it, th those days are over. But I, I see no problem with the BBC. It's hugely loved. Um, people, people want individual services from the BBC, yeah. and they should pay for them. Um, I mean, I get Sky. I go down every year ticking the box of the things from Sky I want, I mean, four, five, six of them. I pay far more than the licence fee for them, mm. and I do so happily. Uh, I pay a large sum of money for Radio 4. I pay quite a lot of money for Radio 3. I pay a lot of money for BBC 4. I want these things. I don't want the BBC arbitrarily to cut BBC 4 um, because they can't afford it. Um, I cannot see what's wrong with the subscription BBC, and nor can they really. They're just terrified of it, that's all. <laughs> any, any other comments on the floor on the BBC? Any other thoughts on the BBC? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? T t t two here at the front and two at the, two at the back, please. This lady at the front. Thank you very much. Yes. Antonio Cox, Westminster Council, where we abolished our grant to the arts entirely. Um, nonetheless, I take Munira's argument that, this, that there's a case for state intervention where the market fails. But what I think we do need to be able to say to the taxpayer is that there is a, a constant check on the extent of the market failure. You, Lizzie, mentioned the rising number of rich people for whom it's a status game to give to the arts. That changes, if that fashions are involved. All the time, there's the, get, the market failure, I think, is changing, perhaps diminishing. And what I'd like to ask Ed is, what can we tell the taxpayer about how often you measure that gap? Because what they tend to think is that there's, there isn't much of a measurement, there's just inertia and a sense of an entitlement from arts bodies, and that's what dictates how much money gets spent. Do you want to answer that? No, no, let's take a... Okay, let's take, keep going, let's crack on. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, my name's uh, Chris Wilford. I'm the son of an artist, and I've got a lot of artists in my family. And often the uh, best work is done when the wolves are at the door. Do you think an indulgent arts policy just subsidises average art and actually austerity breeds great art? Is that to yeah. the whole panel? Are you, are you asking anyone in particular? Yep. And Jeremy, did you want to... And we've got a couple at the back as well. <clears throat> Can we just Sli keep on... Slightly yeah. mischievously ask Ed what plans the government has to ensure that what uh, Baz has just called the national sport of chart overview is not led and dominated by the institution that is being reviewed. And then we've got a couple of comments in the middle the section there. I think final, final questions and comments from the middle block. Thank you very much. And then we're going to try to do, use our iPads, I think, attempt to. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, the name's Adrian Hilton. I, I'm in the Department of Education at Oxford University, but I'm also an alumnus of the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and of the Globe Theatre. The economic reality is that if you want to fill your theatre and make money, you stage Macbeth. That's been the case for 400 years. If you want to stage the three parts of Henry VI now without state subsidy, you either persuade Queen Margaret to get her kit off or you cast the latest Doctor Who as the king. My point, or my question, uh, since we're dealing with he who pays the piper, in the era I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company, Richard Luce came to visit us. You will remember him Great as Margaret, Margaret Thatcher's arts minister. He was booed and hissed by 
a number of spear carriers. <laughs> uh, and and, and the, the, the reality <laughs> is that all the new work being developed by the state companies tends to lean towards the left. Is it not the case that if the state is paying the piper, the piper is going to tend to lure the state, hypnotize the state into melodious views of financing more pipers? Where are the right-wing playwrights? Thank you very much. Behind you, the gentleman behind you. Thank you. Uh, this my final name is, comment. My name is question. Michael Johnson. Um, it's really, this is a, a question trope comment directed at Sir Simon, uh, who, of whom I am a considerable fan. But, um, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> with respect. <laughs> no, um, you, you hinted at the use of price um, and, and uh, talking about people should be prepared to pay for things. I say yes, but one observation I'd like to pass to you all is that. Last year, uh, I asked uh, the, the children in a North London primary school, we have 420 children in that school, how many of them had ever visited a cathedral in London? In the whole school, the answer was two. And we were so shocked, I was on the Board of Governors at the time, we were so shocked by this that we wrote to all the parents to inquire why. And the message that predominantly came back, and it doesn't matter whether you believe it or accept it, it is the message that we received, was price. And I, this is something that I don't have an answer to, but it, I I'm filled with angst whenever I walk past one of our great cathedrals that for a family of four to go in, it costs a lot of money. Thank and you. I, so this is my request, my plea, whatever, however you wish to interpret it, uh, really to the minister rather than Simon, is please ponder that. Thank you very much. A final comment goes to the gentleman holding up the pen on the aisle there. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, very much. My name is John Bullard. I have a very short uh, comment or question to the panel. Simon Jenkins mentioned that people love views, and certainly Professor Scruton will know of an artist called Snaffles, who once painted a beautiful picture <laughs> called The Finest View in Europe. And that had in the picture a fox, some hounds, and the artist himself had the view between the horse's ears. My question to the panel is what on earth would Snaffles do now since the government has banned that particular activity? <laughs> right, thank you very much for that. I think most of those questions were, were for you, Ed, but anyone else wants to chip in, <clears throat> then um, please do. Bring back fox hunting. <clears throat> well, uh, just leave it to me, guys. Um, first of all, I would say that the question where are the right-wing playwrights, was a question that Manira Mirza put on a panel where, which I was on five or six years ago. Manira and I have been doing this job together, as it were, for, for too long, <laughs> in Manira's case. No, for, too, for longer than we care to remember. So I know that Manira will be very interesting and provocative on where are the right-wing playwrights, which I think links with snaffles, uh, because Manira's point was, why can't you go to a London theatre and see a play uh, a pro fox hunting play. Because if, if, if fundamentally the arts is about uh, questioning the establishment and the establishment view and turning it around, at the time the establishment view of fox hunting was a terrible thing, and where was the National Theatre commissioning the young playwright to defend fox hunting? I think that uh, that goes to really Antonia's question as well, which is about inertia, and I do think it's something that the Arts Council has to guard against. Uh, you know, there are certain core institutions that I, I think we should always fund, and I would include the Royal Opera House, the Royal Shakespeare Company and others in that. But it is very important, I think, that the Arts Council refreshes the organisations that it funds as much as possible. And it's important, I think, for Peter himself to get out more, you know, see different people from different kind of backgrounds and the kind of people he stop normally... Stop mixing with people like you. you he no, exactly. Yeah. You've got to stop mixing, hanging around with people like me and start getting out there and seeing a few different people and bringing them into the Arts Council. So the Arts Council's got to be quite open. Now, I'm very keen for the Arts Council to be seen as an organisation uh, for everyone involved in the arts to come to for advice and to see a range of different voices on the Arts Council board that are not from uh, the usual suspects. Um, I do think that uh, in terms of... Uh, the RSC and the Globe and playing safe. I mean, it's interesting that no one has asked the contrast between the RSC state subsidised uh, and the Globe funded by private philanthropy. But I think both take risks. I saw uh, Midsummer Night's Dream put on by um, 
definitely theatre, which is a theatre for uh, where all the actors are deaf and the players performed in sign language, and it was an absolutely mesmerising experience. Uh, I don't think Matilda is a particularly left-wing uh, play, and the RSC was behind uh, the success of Matilda as well as uh, others. So I think uh, you know the RSC does take risks, and I do, but I think private and public are capable of uh, taking risks. Uh, and cathedrals, there are certain questions that I shouldn't now answer because they're hostages to fortune. How are we going to make sure the BBC doesn't out-lobby the government? I think uh, the point is made, Jeremy, and the point has hit home. Uh, and I do, funnily enough, I do, uh, the questioner may be surprised. Liz is trying to shut me up now. The questioner may be surprised, but I do actually ponder the charges of our cathedrals because I'm very sympathetic to the point that he makes. And we did extract some money from the Treasury for this cathedral's fund, the £20 million that's going to repairs. Now, that's not going to reduce the ticket prices, but I do think uh, the risk of, you know, uh, seeing uh, creeping nationalisation coming through, that government has a role in supporting our cathedrals and working with our cathedrals, the finest buildings in Britain, to ensure that they are open and accessible to as many people as possible. So your point is very well made, and it's one that I've pondered for many years. Thank you very much. Can... I, yes, good, I'm gonna, thank you for adding that. Thank you very much. I'm just going to wrap up by saying we've got two polls to vote hey, hold on. on. They all, don't they want to come in? No, we can't, I'm okay. sorry, I can't. I'm afraid you've we've spoken too long. No, no, no so you've spe um, we hogged all the end of that, that <laughs> well, session, I'm afraid. So, is it, two questions, if you can, if you can navigate the, the, the iPad, oh, sorry, iPad technology. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is it time to end the taxpayer funding of the arts, is the question the CPS wants to ask you. I think it's the and, and should British taxpayers continue to fully subsidise the BBC? <coughs> is, can we have a show of hands if people can't work out the Could you iPads? put the first question rather than put both questions at once? First question, is it time to end the taxpayer funding of the arts? Yes. Oh, there we there's are. there's no Wi-Fi. This is an, un, un, this is not not an unrepresentative they're sample, voted, but even they're so... They're voted six in favour of the proposition. And everyone else against, is that correct? Apart from a few they, li they could be abstaining. That's no abstentions. One abstention. Um, thank you. Should British taxpayers continue to fully, fully subsidise the BBC? Yes. No. Very good. Well, I think that for a CPS audience, that's very encouraging in many ways. Thank you so much for, you, for coming, and thank you very much to my panel for making the time to be here.